A woman says she's raped, beaten, choked, threatened by a politician. She goes to police to report the incident. She's interviewed for four hours. The person she's accusing? Yeah, it took police weeks to question him. He turned himself in and was released hours later. How's that? Welcome to Narnia. My next guest needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. She is a women's rights activist, a human rights defender, the director of Equality Bahamas, which promotes women's rights as human rights. And she's also a columnist with the Tribune in Nassau, Bahamas. Welcome to the show, Alicia Wallace. Alicia, it is so good to have you on the show. Thank you so much for carving out time in your busy schedule because I know you used to be busy. I'm so happy to be here to talk to you again. So let's just jump right in with this story that has been on everyone's tongues for the past several weeks. And I'm talking about the recent rape allegation involving uh, a sitting MP or the Progressive Liberal Party member of parliament. Um, and I want to speak specifically about the police's handling of this case and its decision to wait to question this alleged attacker. What do you make of all of this? I'm definitely concerned about this major delay in police even trying to talk to this person. We have the story. We know that the woman who has accused this particular member of parliament went to the police some time ago. She went to the extent of moving, going from one island to the next to make this police report because, you know, we're in such small communities and, you know, people know each other. And particularly when we're talking about people in positions of power, it can get very complicated and she went to this extent she has the support of her family members who went with her she did everything that she possibly could including going to the media and the police are just very comfortably telling us that no we haven't questioned him yet we're still doing our investigations and the commissioner of police going to the extent of saying that they're not going to be rushed by social media they don't care what we're talking about they know how to do their jobs. The prime minister saying the police knows how to do their jobs, which is another story that we could get into because there are some responsibilities there that are being completely eschewed. But this is a major concern. Since we heard this story about the accusations against the MP, there has been the story of the woman who was sexually assaulted on a cruise ship. And in the same article where that was reported, it said that that person, the accused person was arrested. We have the story of a woman who is raped in Cat Key and that person was arrested and is assisting with investigations. So what's the difference there? I think we know what the difference is. The difference is because of who's involved politically. And it's been said several times and there have been members of um, this progressive liberal party who were like, no, that, you know, we, we, that's not what it's about. It's about the fact that we have to allow police to do their job. But when we see police doing their job in a sloppy fashion, when they're dragging their feet in, 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 in taking justice, that's a problem. Now, I said several times on my, on my platform that these are still accusations. This person is not convicted. Um, it's just an allegation at this point, but it's still a very serious one. And, you know, it, it just makes me question you know, how women are supposed to feel when they see this happening, especially women who are very timid about coming forward and saying that a man assaulted me sexually or he threatened me or he threatened my family. What message is it sending to those women who are watching this trans uh, transpire? And, the, you know, I, I just feel as if they're going to be like, I'm not even going to touch it. I'm just going to leave it alone because of the way this woman is, is being treated and how she it's being handled. We've always had this issue of women not wanting to report or wanting to report but feeling unable to report or as though they're not going to even access justice or they're going to experience more violence because of their reports. I was recently a part of some research being done to determine the prevalence of domestic violence and intimate partner violence in particular, but also looking at sexual violence, where we interviewed a number of women, we had focus groups, and the vast majority of women who came forward as survivors told us that this was their first time sharing their stories. And they told us that the reasons, the two main reasons that they never shared their stories before, that they never reported to police, was one, they didn't think that they would be believed. And two, they had no confidence that it would remain confidential. A number of them said that they were reporting or they were experiencing violence at the hands of police or people who were family members of police officers. So they were quite sure that their reports wouldn't go anywhere, they would, they would disappear. A couple of women did say that they reported. And one said that the person that was abusing her 
came to her, brought the report and said, this, this is what you think you're going to do? And just ripped it up in front of her. So the police officer, some, someone in police, gave the perpetrator the report and he took it back to this woman and showed her, you cannot do this. You cannot make a report on me. You cannot get away from me. I have more power than you. Who do you think you are? So this story being front and center in the news and us seeing the way that it's being handled and the responses to it, this is very damaging for people who are experiencing violence and for people who may experience violence in the future because it makes it seem as though you do not have the choice. You don't have the opportunity to make a report. And if you dare to make a report, you have to consider all the things that might happen. People are going to be speculating about um, who you are if your story gets out there. They're going to be wondering, you know, did this really happen? Um, why is, you know, this person being targeted? And we know that rape and other forms of sexual violence is an issue of power and control. It is not about sex. Rape is not the same as sex. It's power and control. And it's often a weapon used by people in positions of power. And they know that they can get away with it. So this, this really does not bode well for us, for women in this country, for other people who are in situations of vulnerability, because we know that we are specifically targeted and that there are protected groups of people. And those people are often perpetrators. And if they're not going to be held accountable by their employers, by their colleagues, by law enforcement, by the court system, then what do we have? You know, I always say women can't get a break. We can't get a break. You know, one of the things that especially disturbed me was uh, reading so many comments on social media. Men weighed in, and uh, of course, women did as well. I, I've, I saw a lot of the comments from women, especially. And um, they were questioning, you know, why this alleged victim chose to come out at this time. What do you make of these types of reactions, and where do you think they stem from? It's victim blaming is a very interesting thing. And, you know, it's it's very... It's very frustrating, it's very discouraging, it's a part of rape culture because we normalize sexual violence and we kind of decide that this is something that's going to happen and it's the job of women and girls and um, people with disabilities and other people who are in situations of vulnerability to protect themselves. This is the message that we're consistently sent. So even when we receive crime statistics on the quarterly basis or the annual basis and there are comments on it and they talk to the police press liaison officer or, or whomever, those people say, well, women need to be more careful. You know, they say it in different words, but they essentially say, women just need to just not go outside. Why are you going outside as a woman by yourself? Don't you know you need a male chaperone? You know, I, I, I get so upset, Alicia, when I hear people say, oh, you know, you know, why is she going out in that outfit? Why, why is she walk, walk down that street? Why, is she did the, why did he follow her down that street? Why did he see her wearing that outfit and felt that he had some authority to touch her, to rape her, to hurt her? Like, why are we always, again, blaming the victim? That is, that is the message that's being sent to us, that we have the job to protect ourselves. And I, as an advocate, have shifted away from that language and that idea because it is a huge problem. So, you know, people, reporters might call me and say, we know that you have advocated for the protection of women. I said, I'm going to stop you right there because that's not what I'm advocating for. I am not calling for protection of women. I am calling for a change in society and to create an environment where women do not need protecting. Because if we stick with this protection thing, we're still gonna be in the situation where we need chaperones. You know, one final thing, and I, I appreciate you saying that because I've, I've always been very curious about that. Um, but I met you I first met you many, many moons ago, and I, I'm, I'm sure you don't even remember this. I interviewed you on Bahamas at Sunrise when I would co-host that show. And you were speaking, you were very young. You're still young, <laughs> but you were much younger. Not, not that young. <laughs> <laughs> You're still young, gal. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about street harassment. And you know, I, you know what's so funny? Because at the time, I was like, you're so accustomed to being harassed on the streets in Nassau with the oi, that it becomes yeah. like kind of ingrained in the culture. You were the first person who actually, for me, put that into a phrasing of street harassment where I started to think of it that way. You, young Alicia Wallace, put that in my head. As I was interviewing you, I was like, you know what? It is street harassment. And I wanted to say thank you for the work that you've been doing. Seriously, I truly respect you. And I don't say that for a lot of people 
because I do believe you're the real deal. I do believe that you are passionate about what you do. There are many people who've come along and done, you know, uh, activism work and they've fallen by the wayside because it wasn't really their calling. It wasn't what they truly wanted to. When you, when you speak, at least I believe you. And I really do just want to say thank you, not just for being on this interview, but for the work that you're doing in the Bahamas, because I think our country is going to be better off for it. And so thank you very much for everything. I know it's not easy. I know you got to hear from silly people from time to time, people who are going to dismiss you um, and relegate you to a box. And that gal Eddie, no good and all that stuff. You, your head is very good and you're doing an excellent <laughs> job. Thank you so much. That means so much because, you know, you're out here and sometimes you're kind of by yourself and it feels like, yeah, everyone thinks I'm off my rocker right now. No one wants to listen. Uh, so every now and then someone says, you're making sense. And it's like, oh, OK. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more about Alicia, you can go on her website at AliciaAWallace.com. It's a great website. You can see some of her past articles as well. I've been going through it like crazy. And of course, you're still writing your column with the Tribune. Yes, every Wednesday. I love the Tribune. I used to work for the Tribune. I, I have nothing but respect for them. So you're in, you're in good hands over there. So thank you so much, Alicia. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was great. Anyway, kiddies, that's going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. For those of you who have reached out to say you, you couldn't wait for this conversation, thank you so much for that. And I'm so grateful once again to Alicia Wallace, whom I, I really do love and respect tremendously. Uh, you can read more about her, like I said, at her website, uh, www.aliciaawallace.com. And you can read her columns on the Tribune at tribune242.com, tribune242.com really excellent insight the woman is brilliant so thank you so much alicia and i'll see you guys next week don't forget to follow me on facebook instagram and tiktok i just i said let me let me let me start posting some stuff on tiktok so um on tiktok my handle is this behemoth gal tbg so um be sure to go there and of course on my blog at www.thisbehemothgal.com thank you so much i love you guys and i will see you all next week wednesday bye